Thanks very much. Um, yeah, and normally, I, I've had a couple of glasses of wine before I say digitization, digitalization, and digital, digital transformation, because it is a bit of a tongue twister. Um, so, um, yeah, thank you very much. So, let's start talking about digitization, digitalization, and digital transformation. Terms that are used relatively synonymously, but there is a, a material difference between them. Digitization is essentially turning your documents into digital assets. Your, uh, your handwritten documents, your typed up documents, turning that into a digital document. Digitalization is about taking your processes and turning those processes into a digital process. Digital transformation is about taking digital processes and changing them or introducing new digital processes to make your business more effective and more efficient. So um, by way of an example, um, my, I, I, I didn't see anybody from the pet insurance industry here, so I'll use pet insurance as a, as a scapegoat here. But when I submit a claim for my pet insurance at the moment, I need to handwrite a form which I need to sign physically and scan in and email it through to them. That is a non-digitized process. They then capture all of my information, which is the process of digitization. If they wanted to digitalize that process, they would send me an editable PDF where I capture all the information as digital information, which I email through to them, and they then process my claim, because now everything is digitized and digitalized automatically. Digital transformation would be to say, we have a portal. Please log in, fill in all of your information on our portal, and your claim will be automatically processed because the data is now being captured directly into the database as opposed to having to be manually captured. So we've transformed our business using digital processes to make it more efficient. So in a nutshell, the difference between digitization, digitalization, and digital transformation. Underlying to all of that is data. And data lives everywhere. In this day and age, it might be um, structured data in a database, it might be unstructured data, file and folder, it might be semi-structured data in your big data envir uh, environments, your um, non-SQL indexed data uh, stores. So you've, you've got that type of data. You've got data at rest and data in motion. Uh, you've got data in use. You've got um, data in physical environments and in, in virtual environments. You've got data on premise or in the cloud, public cloud, private cloud. You, data, there is data everywhere and, and, and there is this challenge of how do we access it, how do we manage it, how do we secure it, how do we even know where it is. There's also an immense amount of data being generated every day. Everybody's a content creator. Some people get paid lots of money for it. Unfortunately, I'm not one of those. But lots of people get a lot of money for creating content. But there is a lot of content being created every day. All of us are, are writing documents, writing emails, and that is data, that is content that's being created. From a business perspective, that content, that data, is being accessed by everybody as well. In the good old days, Finance data was accessed by the finance department if they were lucky. Now, um, that data is being stored in a database and uh, being populated by systems, and there are customers and partners and um, third parties and internal and consultants. Everybody needs to get access to that data to be able to do their jobs. So there's a lot of data, and there are a lot of people that are accessing that data. And to be aware of that, that data is exposed to risk. Um, the gentleman from, from Rockwell cons, um, was talking about uh, the 
um, operational technology and the risk that they're exposed to. I'm gonna focus on data security, but in the main, the attacks are pretty similar. There are really three things that can happen to your data if you are being attacked. Your data can be stolen. People can come into your environment, take your data away. Your data can be made unavailable. A denial of service attack, a ransomware attack. Your d data is unavailable for you to be able to access it to do your job. Or your data can be changed, manipulated. So th those are the kind of risks that your data is exposed to. And in the main, every attack that you're gonna face will fall into one of those three categories. Um, sorry, I, I, I had a, a thought which has now skipped off the top of my head. Uh, when you have an attack in your environment, people use the term data breach um, and a, um, sorry, uh, again, um, word skipping off, off my mind. You, you, you have, um, I'll, I'll get back to that point, um, in, in potentially in the Q&A. But regardless to say, the data that you have is at risk and you need to protect against that. And what is driving the reason for that protection? It's really twofold. One is compliance. There are compliance mandates in South Africa, the Poppy Act, uh, financial services industry has um, PCI DSS. There are lots of regulations that drive that. There are also standards. ITIL, ISO, whatever standard your company um, subscribes to that says you need to do these things. And then they, your, audit, your audit processes, internal and external, that says you need to comply to certain things and you will pass or fail an audit if you don't do that. So you need to be compliant to those things. So compliance drives a lot of the data um, security requirements. There's also the data security side of things. You need to keep your data secure to mitigate risk. Um, by way of an example, a banking process, um, if I want to do an international funds transfer, I go into the branch, I say that I want to transfer some money, I'm gonna pick on Corradino because I know he's from Italy. Um, if I want to transfer money to Corradino in, in Italy, I go to the bank and I say, please transfer X amount of money from my account in South Africa to Corradino's account in, in Italy. The cashier captures that information, it sits in the core banking application. For anybody in the banking industry, you will know it then goes to a system called AML. And from AML, it will go to SWIFT or Western Union or whatever mechanism is used to transfer that, that money from South Africa to Italy. Those processes should be typically secure. The core banking application is encrypted, AML does everything in memory and has access control, and SWIFT, for all of the, the beatings that they've gotten, is a pretty secure system. So the process looks secure. We are aware of incidents where fraud has taken place in that environment because the communication, the data as it flows, is exposed. There's not a compliance mandate that says you need to do X to protect against that. That is a security process that says if you don't do that, you're going to lose money. So compliance drives, and in a lot of our engagements as vendors to industry, they say, how does this help me comply? The side of how does this make me more secure is often missed or neglected. So it's quite important. Going back to my point about a, a breach because the words have come back to me. People will use the term breach and compromise synonymously. In essence, it would be better for an industry to make a little bit of a distinction between a breach and a compromise because it will help you understand your risk and the threat and help you to uh, put solutions in place to mitigate each one of those. So a breach means somebody got in. They were able to get into your environment. They breached your network, your perimeter, your security protocols. They breached. 
A compromise means they were able to do something bad. So if you make the distinction between a breach and a compromise, you want to stop the breach. You want to protect your infrastructure. You want to protect your, um, your environment. To mitigate a compromise, you want to protect what they're after, the asset, the data. And that distinction is valuable when you are looking at uh, data security and protecting your environment. I have a recap slide. Um, this, this is more because everything that I've had is just pictures. So anybody who gets the benefit of getting these slides, I'm not sure if they're going to be distributed after the fact. You've got a whole lot of pictures which don't really mean anything to you when you're looking back at them. This is just a recap slide to touch on the points that I've spoken about. And then, uh, as a small apology, my last slide that I'm going to present on now is a, it's a vendor slide. It's a, it's a technology slide. But it's more about the framework as opposed to what we could necessarily do to address this. So if you are looking at a data privacy and security framework, there are a couple of things that you need to take into consideration. You need to be able to protect your data wherever it is. And I've gave the examples in the beginning, whether it's structured or unstructured or semi-structured, physical machines, virtual machines, whether it's in containers, whether it's being uh, uh, accessed by microservices, whether it's in a public cloud or a private cloud flowing across a network. As, a, as an industry, as a business, you should not care where that data is. You should care that it is protected. Then you need to be able to protect it. And th there was a comment um, in the first session um, at the, the round table about the vendors that say, we can solve for all problems. Geez, I wish we could solve for all problems. Um, we, we have more problems than we can solve for as an industry, never mind as a single vendor. But you need to look at a unified approach to solving this problem. So by way of example in the data security um, environment. Start with data discovery and classification. Identify where your data assets are, because when you know where they are, they're easier to protect. There's, there's a lot of uh, creep of technology and product in, in the IT space, and being able to know where everything is all the time is incredibly difficult. Uh, I, there's a bank that I'm aware of when they were doing their um, AD consolidation, I don't know if people, um, there, there are a few people in the industry, I, Barsi made, made a point that he's retired already, so there are a couple of people older than me, but back in the day, active directories were cre created left, right, and center, and it only came about a bit later that a single AD was the way to go. One of the banks I was working with um, in, the, in the early 2000s, they were doing an AD consolidation. And they believed that they had 60 or 70 AD um, trees in, in their environment that they wanted to consolidate. They then went and did a scan to see what they had to discover they had in excess of 3,000 active directories in their environment that people had just set up. It's the same with your IT. People buy technology, they set up databases, they put file shares in place that you're not even aware of. So a process of discovery is incredibly important. And then you need to go through a process of protection. And again, I apologize, my slide talks around the technologies that we provide, but you need to be able to protect those data assets. Whether it is a process of encryption or a process of monitoring or um, integrity checking, uh, a, a process of access control, there's a lot that you need to do and can do to protect that data. And then it's about ensuring that those protection mechanisms are in the same place. Let's, let's talk about, um, and, and um, we won't talk about my technology here, we'll talk about something else. To let's talk about access. Active, um, administrator access. Uh, administrators have access to their, um, the systems that they need access to. And in the older days, and for a lot of people it still exists today, administrator credentials live everywhere. A technology exists called privileged access management, which allows 
all of those credentials to be stored in a central vault. And they don't get distributed. You get given a temporary access that is based on those credentials that allows you to do your job in line with the whole thinking of zero trust. Mitigating those risks, <clears throat> centralizing your controls, and then giving the access on a need to know a time and place when you need to access it. These are the kinds of controls that you need to be putting in place with the technologies um, that you have. Further to that, in South Africa, it's, a, it's significantly more relevant than in the rest of Africa where cloud is not readily adopted. Everything is cloud. Everybody wants to put everything in the cloud. Some stuff lives in the cloud, I agree with that, but not everything should go to the cloud. But there's this big drive to the cloud. Very few companies exist in the cloud in its entirety. There are some. Not many or any in South Africa that I'm aware of. But any technology you look at needs to be able to address cloud. But it also needs to be able to address on-premise. And ideally what you're looking for is a technology that addresses on-prem and in the cloud with the same technology. You don't want different tools for different environments. You're wanting to protect from the same environment allows for automation and orchestration. It, it, you, you need to be able to interface. Uh, every time I go and see a customer, they say, Neil, my environment is unique. And I say, yes, Mr. Customer, your environment is unique, just like everybody else. Your environment is unique. You use software and, and versions of software and technologies and architectures that are different. And any technology you, you acquire needs to be able to fit into that. And you need the ability to be able to unify your policies and procedures across the entire organization, getting rid of those silos, making the business manageable in its, in, in its entirety. And then you need to be able to centralize your reviewing and tracking of that. So as a, a, a last comment before I open up for questions, and we have a couple of minutes for questions, and I am aware I'm standing between you and your lunch. Um, from an IT security or a data security perspective, securing the data is very, very important. But the business operation at the end of the day is more important. If your security is going to stop the business from operating, you're basically cutting the throat of the golden goose. You cannot stop your business, you need to securely enable your business with your security technologies. With that, I thank you, and I'll open the floor to any questions. The lights in my eyes are very bright, and my, the glare on my glasses, so um, if there are any questions, can somebody in the, in the back just hand out a mic? So uh, I'm going to assume that either I'm such a good presenter that the message was so clear there were no questions, or lunch is so good that you guys are all ready to rush off for lunch. So I'd like to thank you very much. I will be around for the next couple of hours. Feel free to come and have a chat. All right. <laughs>